Hello, I'm Dr. Stacy Truskin, Chief Medical Officer at Mazzoni Center in Philadelphia. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. John Ward, who is the Director for the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination. Welcome to this program entitled Hepatitis B at a Crossroads, Breaking Barriers in Diagnosis and Treatment. This program is supported by an independent educational grant from GSK. So, John, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Stacey. It's great to be here. So let's start talking about why hepatitis B is important. What are your thoughts here? Why now? Well, it's a um, large uh, problem in the United States. There's an estimated uh, 600,000 to an estimate could be as high as 2.4 million people living with chronic hepatitis B. Uh, the slide is showing how uh, mortality from hepatitis B has increased in uh, recent years, uh, reflecting the uh, access to testing, which is needed for hepatitis B, which often, as you know, progresses over time with relatively few clinical symptoms until the onset of severe liver disease and liver cancer. Uh, and that's why we're talking about options for, for changing that. Now, one good news uh, from this slide is there are declines in new infections uh, reflecting the benefits of hepatitis B vaccination, uh, beginning with infants with a, a timely birth dose of hepatitis B vaccination to newborns, and then so that can protect them in later years, as well as the recommendations for all adults now to be vaccinated. Uh, but for those who became infected before they could receive that protected vaccine, we need to test them, diagnose them, and get them into care. Yeah, exactly. And so I think thinking about, based on all of this data, why hepatitis B is still underdiagnosed and undertreated. Um, you alluded to the fact that there are now recommendations for, for testing. I know the CDC now recommends that everyone 18 or older received the triple screen, which is surface antigen, core antibody, and also surface antibody. And so even with these recommendations, why do you think that hepatitis B is still underdiagnosed? Well, number one, and it's one of the reasons we're talking about it on uh, World Hepatitis Day is just the lack of awareness of hepatitis B. You know, it's a uh, you know, like as I've mentioned, it's a fairly silent infection. I think uh, oftentimes it's uh, overlooked. You know, based on CDC estimates, about uh, maybe about 50% of people with hepatitis B have been diagnosed with a, a smaller proportion receiving uh, treatment. Um, uh, sometimes it's associated uh, with uh, socially stigmatizing behaviors, uh, such as. Uh, uh, persons who inject uh, drugs uh, have uh, about 11-fold higher risk of hepatitis B than the uh, general um, person uh, in the country. Um, uh, uh, and so I, th I think that's, you know, some of the reasons for it. I think in that lack of awareness extends to clinic, uh, clinicians not recognizing the benefits of treatment uh, with the current treatment and the prospects we have uh, for more effective treatments in the near future. Yeah. I think one of the other challenges too, as somebody who oversees a primary care practice, is that primary care providers are asked to do so much in such little time. And the triple screen, even though it's recommended, is one more thing. There's all different types of preventative health measures that primary care providers are responsible for. And I think that's where it becomes really important to leverage the electronic medical record to uh, support the clinical decision making. Things like reminders, utilizing order sets, templates, and things like that to really make it so that some of this testing is is automated, or that the clinician has, um, you know, really maximized the power of an electronic medical record to support some of that clinical decision making. Otherwise, it's a lot to keep track of. That's right. And, you know, I mentioned that, you know, there are certain populations that are at higher risk for hepatitis B. In addition to these adult risk behaviors, 
you know, there's a lot of people who become infected at birth and, and as infants because that's when your risk of remaining chronically infected is highest is if you're infected at birth, 90% risk or uh, less than five years of age, 50% risk. So many people are infected um, in, in early life and then they have about a one in four chance of dying early from liver uh, failure uh, or liver cancer. Um, as particularly uh, prevalent among people born in countries where uh, hepatitis B is, is most common, such as the countries of Asia and the countries of Africa. Uh, so it's important to recognize some of those larger populations. Ask yourself if, how many of your po patients uh, are in some of those populations. But the reason CDC moved and recommended strongly a, a recommendation for everyone to, to be tested is to just normalize the access to this preventive service as we do for screening other causes of cancer, which hepatitis B is certainly one, um, and to um, remove any stigmas that can limit uh, someone saying yes uh, when offered uh, a, a, a test. Uh, so I think that's what is why I think we're now at a crossroads is, is moving into a, um, a routine delivery of screening and linkage to care and treatment for people with hepatitis B. Right. And, and I think, John, what you're really describing is that routine opt out screening, right? And we think about so many things in the course of a medical visit as routine and opt out. For example, screening for your lipid panel or diabetes. We don't specifically ask patients to opt in to that. We'll say, hey, I want to get your, your routine blood work today. Um, let me know if you have any issues with that. And then they can opt out. And the hepatitis B triple screen should just be part of that. And in such, it destigmatizes it, as you say. So um, thinking about how we as clinicians incorporate that into our clinical workflows, our electronic medical record, and our conversations with our patients is really, really key. Um, when we think about new tools that are available to support early detection, um, what, what comes to mind for you, John? Well, as far as new sort of new new test, you know, I think we have a long-standing test of hepatitis B surface antigen that's uh, you know been around for for decades, uh, but is the really the signal that someone has active hepatitis B infection and needs you know care and treatment, and so that's really of those three tests uh, that hepatitis B surface antigen is most important to identify someone that needs that uh, that care. And I think you raised some of the new tools is how do you do begin to apply that test so that it can be you know, widely available um, and provided by, you know, clinicians who um, you know, understand uh, enough about hepatitis B of how to manage that patient, you know, in their own practice or who to refer that patient to for, for that care um, you know, and treatment. Um, so I think education is really important for clinicians. Um, I think it always helps for patients to be more aware of hepatitis B so that they are understanding when the test is offered. So I think we have work to do to increase awareness for, in the general public, patients, and uh, uh, clinicians uh, throughout, uh, throughout health systems. Yes, agreed, agreed. So in light of these new recommendations um, for testing for the CDC, we still fall short with treating individuals. And I think there are a bunch of different reasons that, that we've landed in this space of um, leaving so many individuals with chronic hepatitis B untreated. I think the first is that the guidelines historically have been varied depending on where you live in the world, whether you live in Europe versus um, the United States versus in parts of Asia, the, the guidelines vary and there hasn't been consensus on what treatment looks like, what are the thresholds for which we initiate treatment. Um, and even within each of those guidelines, they, they're a little bit confusing for folks. I know even as somebody that, that has had this as a focus of my career, I still have had to, in the past, pull up the guidelines to remind myself, does somebody qualify for treatment? 
And I, I do think that there is a real movement now with the World Health Organization's recent updates to treatment guidelines that um, we're moving towards a, a more simplified approach that lowers the threshold for treatment. Um, but I, I think um, we still have a lot of work to do. What are your thoughts, John, on some of those treatment gaps? Well, I, I agree with all your, you know, all your points. I think the also, you know, as part of that, you know, there's been new science to, um, to uh, help, um, help us recognize the, the benefits of treatment, you know, at an earlier stage of disease of, from hepatitis B, you know, differences in, you know, viral replication and the impacts on um, disease progression, you know, immune system exhaustion, you know, other, other, other outcomes that weren't as well appreciated in prior years. So there's really been a shift, I believe, from being very cautious and conservative about who should be treated more toward uh, expansion and uh, uh, for a larger proportion of persons with hepatitis B to be eligible for treatment really as soon as they're diagnosed. Um, the WHO has stepped in that direction, uh, and we're looking to see uh, what are the new treatment guidelines coming for the United States that will also reflect that uh, expansion of treatment. Um, you know, because the, you know, the current treatments you know, are very safe. Uh, they provide about a 50 to 60 percent reduction in the risk of a disease progression to liver cancer. And you have new, uh, new therapies know, in development that can increase the benefits of those treatments in the future. And then you then have to move into implementation, as you're pointing out, and it's really uh, seeing how you can simplify um, uh, care algorithms, clinical decision making to help that primary care physician uh, who's a clinician who's very busy uh, integrate this into their practice in a way that's feasible for the provider and beneficial for the patient. Yeah, well said. So as we talk about the purpose of, of treatment, this concept of functional cure comes up. And I know that um, our understanding of functional cure has evolved, but why don't you, you share a little bit about what, what, how you think about functional cure, how it's defined currently? Functional cure is really looking ahead toward uh, more effective treatments. And the definition of functional cure uh, for me, is the uh, the loss of hepatitis B surface antigen, uh, no evidence of viral replication after a time limited uh, course of treatment uh, has ended. So those benefits of treatment persist after treatment is stopped. Yeah, and I think this concept of a functional cure is is evolving, and we're getting closer. There are lots of clinical trials for hepatitis B treatment. Some of them look at, at interrupting the, the cycle of viral replication, others really on immune response of the host. And it's an exciting time. I think in, yeah. we're gonna see a, a real evolution of our, our understanding of what, what functional cure is and, and the percentage of folks that get there with treatment. So with this, John, I know that we often get some, some questions as we're, we're out in the community or talking with colleagues. Um, some of the key questions that I've seen from colleagues have been around vaccination, um, specifically around birth dose vaccination. Um, can you share a little bit about uh, birth dose vaccinations and, and the importance of those from an epidemiologic perspective? As you know, Stacey, this is a... A topic very close to me, I used to be the director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis and was the author of several versions of ACIP recommendations for hepatitis B vaccine. And as I mentioned, hepatitis B vaccine is critically important uh, to be given to, you know, all newborns because of that high risk of chronic infection if they become infected and to infants for the, for also for their, for their risk. Um, and when you do that, the prevalence drops dramatically among vaccinated children, and that vaccine coverage by the latest data uh, lasts for at least 40 years. So it really extends into adulthood. And so you have a population in, increasing in, in number over time that's protected from hepatitis B. Now the birth dose is important because you wanna give that 
um, to protect that infant. Now, we also in the United States uh, screen pregnant women for hepatitis B so that there's certainty that that infant can receive that timely birth dose within 24 hours so that they get the protection from that vaccine. And you know, uh, study after study after study has shown hepatitis B birth dose vaccination is very safe. And the benefits of protecting all children from this chronic infection uh, greatly exceeds any risk uh, from that uh, vaccination. Uh, so it's, it's, it's critically important for us to continue to have high rates of hepatitis B vaccination for infants beginning at birth. So with that, I want to just close out this conversation. Thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure as always chatting with you. Um, and to all of our, our viewers who are stayed with us, thank you so much for joining us for the conversation. Thank you, Stacy.